Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation to your conference. I'm sorry I can't do this in Finnish, but uh, knowing your own language, I assume you understand that. Um, whenever I turn around a little bit, I do that because I don't see my presentation here on the screen. I just need to know where I am. Um, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, what Knowledge on Ledge does, um, starting off with how we see or what we see as challenges in open access, then talking about um, one possible response. Uh, you all know that there are more responses out there, and uh, we are just one player uh, in that field. Um, how the model of Knowledge on Ledge has developed, and then certainly what we are doing right now, because we are now in our final phase of the pledging round 2017 and need basically every support. Uh, I'll show you a little bit what we are doing differently this year. I don't want to go too much into detail because you will get these charts and you have already had a long discussion around open access. So what I think is um, most important uh, for us is that for us open access really is an organizational challenge uh, to the players involved, to both publishers um, and also libraries and research funders, to researchers not so much, um, and also to the initiatives um, in the field. So I think there are, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, and we, when we talk about open access for books, a lot of challenges that have to be tackled, and libraries are only starting now to realize the differences between APC-funded journals or also um, other models of funding and um, open access for books. Um, let me tell you a little bit what um, Knowledge Unlatched is. I didn't have this great idea, I have to admit. It was Francis Pinter who launched Knowledge Unlatched or started conversations around Knowledge Unlatched in 2012. Uh, and her idea was to help solving the gap between funders, librarians and publishers um, around open access. Uh, she really wanted to position the initiative between the two chairs, which is always a difficult, or three chairs in this case, a difficult position, um, but um, I think she succeeded with what she did. She focused very much on monographs in the humanities and social sciences, nothing but that, uh, really a laboratory situation. Um, it was only focused on front list and only English language titles at the point. Um, the idea was to really create a system that doesn't revolutionize um, um, fun or publishing basically um, with a step from traditional models to open access, but really is something that the French would call a restorative model. So we really want to make sure that the players stay in place, that the structure, how deals are being done between publishers and libraries stays in place, and it is not the idea to revolutionize the space and eliminate either libraries or um, publishers. Um, the idea of Knowledge Unlatched is that uh, there is a cost sharing for our own cost between libraries and publishers, and we also do something which we call KU Research, and I can talk a lot about that if you want just a little bit, because I'm not involved. You probably saw the open access landscape study that was just published by uh, Knowledge Unlatched Research. Um, that's basically a sister organization. Now, how does the model work? It's pretty easy. Publishers submit titles in the humanities and social sciences to Knowledge Unlatched. Um, the um, title selection committee made up of librarians selects a number of titles out of the submitted titles and everybody can participate in that process. Um, so it is an open process. You can all apply if you want. You will get access to our platform where the selection process can be done. And um, what comes out of that is, at the end of the selection process, a list of titles that is being shown to librarians, and they can then decide whether they want to pledge, whether they want to financially support that model, the titles that are on the list. If that, which we all hope, uh, will be the case at the end of November for this round, um, the titles will be unlatched based on the fact that we collect the money from the libraries and redistribute the money to the publishers involved. Um, so a fairly easy and straightforward process, one should think. Uh, it's not that easy uh, if you then really do it in real life because publishers tend to postpone new publications, as you know. Libraries tend to um, wait very long with their decision making, which gives me sleepless nights right now um, because we don't know yet whether we have reached the um, pledging target. But this is, in principle, a really simple process. Um, just to give you a few numbers, um, with the um, we have two namings with the first round of Knowledge Unlatched. 
uh, which was the uh, pilot, uh, we started off with very low numbers. So Francis, as I said, wanted a laborato laboratory situation and just went for 28 titles uh, that were unlatched in that round. They were selected from 60 titles submitted by publishers. And the idea was not to say uh, we have an additional peer review process, but rather there is a group of librarians making sure that these titles have the broadest possible reach in the world, so that as many libraries as possible can participate and that it is not a specialized um, whatever um, uh, research that is being done um, um, or just interested for, interesting for a few libraries. So it is really important that all titles are being peer reviewed in the publishing houses and not by knowledge unledged. We are just making sure that the relevance is as high as possible. You can see that there is a significant scaling effect um, with the titles submitted, we are limiting the submissions to 10 titles for front list and 10 titles for back list each because we want to make sure um, that larger publishers don't basically spam the whole system with hundreds or thousands of titles, uh, especially in the back list. Um, as we are a very small organization of just four or five people, we need to use these kinds of methods to really make sure that we are not kind of uh, overwhelmed by the workload. You can see that the titles accepted between 2016 and 2017 is stable. The number 343 is just a coincidence uh, and uh, we are not going like for the third digit behind the comma, um, even though we are in some cases Germans. Um, so this is, not, this is just a coincidence because a few titles have been pulled out by publishers and so on. Uh, we limited the number of titles at 350, that was the initial goal in the um, fourth round for KU to select 2017 because we realized that funding is limited for open access books and libraries can't keep up with the pace of adding more titles. And to be very clear, if we would have enough money, it would be from libraries and from other funders, it would be really easy to create the biggest HSS publisher, if you want to call us a publisher, um, in the world um, within a year or two. So publishers are very open to submit many, many titles into this system. It is just a matter of funding right now that has to keep up uh, with this development. Um, and um, going from there, you can see uh, which presses we are working with. This is all on our website, by the way, so you don't, uh, this is always a selection of um, partners, uh, which is knowledgeunledged.org, so you can see who is on the title selection committee, people with their names on it, which publishers um, are participating, which libraries have pledged already, so it is trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, you see here a little bit of an information on the publishers for the books, um, and um, we have so far um, released a number of titles. We are at 450 titles right now. Um, there are, is a lot of techniques, basically, um, that is linked to it because we are only dealing with libraries, with academic libraries, and we're trying to make sure that the titles within Knowledge Unledged have the same quality as any ebook um, uh, deal um, that a library is making, just that they are for free to readers. When we looked at the landscape, we realized that um, books might not be enough. That is why 2017 is the first year where we also have a pledging round for journals. It is time-wise in parallel with books. And also beyond that, we try to make sure that it's as closely interlinked as possible. You see that 40% um, of all research in the humanities and social sciences by market volume is published in journals, um, much more in the social sciences than in the humanities. Um, there are a lot of funders, as you know, that um, try to uh, flip models, flip journals and into open access. And certainly publishers realize that and are under pressure as well. So especially the smaller publishers, uh, the non-Springers uh, and Elseviers in the world, have difficulties in coming up with business models and reaching out to the libraries to really succeed in that thrive. And what we are trying to do is to support them. Now, um, myself coming from the publishing side, um, you know that there are all these kinds of little tricks to get uh, um, not so high quality content uh, into these kinds of packages. That's why we have limited uh, the access of content uh, into the model. You can see that we have a number of journals out there now, 21 journals from different publishing houses. Um, you see a few of them there and they have to fulfill certain criteria. 
they should at least um, not journal, uh, they should at least um, publish um, 20 articles. Sorry, that's a misspelling. 20 articles per year. They should be around 10 years old, so that it's not all the new starts that are being um, pushed into uh, these packages. And in this case, other than for books, for journals, it is a three-year commitment that people have to make. You can see the cost. I put it in here for you so the, that you can see the cost. 21 journals at a cost of 2,175 uh, euros per year. And we have tried to make sure and calculate that this is really a cost-effective way as well for a library, assuming that a library certainly has subscribed to all of these uh, journals, to just give you an idea of how we come up with our figures. Because we certainly do realize that there is a risk of um, free rider, that libraries basically sit and wait that somebody else pays, um, and nobody does in the end. Um, so that's why we are trying to optimize even for the libraries participating, that they get a good price out of, uh, a good uh, ticket out of uh, Knowledge Unlatched. Um, I want to raise a few issues, uh, probably also for the discussion which might be interesting, which we have been tackling over the last um, years, one and a half years, I would say. Um, we have the feeling that Knowledge Unlatched is, if you want, emotionally well established, um, but we certainly know that there are a lot of hiccups still in the system that not only Knowledge Unlatched, but also many other initiatives uh, are facing. One of them is uh, that we need to make sure that these titles are really discoverable. And I don't know whether you saw our announcement that in the third quarter of 2017, our usage figures doubled from one quarter to another compared to the second quarter. Um, and we are really fascinated by that, by seeing that all these initiatives finally pay off and that open access has a much higher benefit and Springer Nature has shown that in their last analysis as well, has a better benefit to researchers and to research um, than paywalled content. So what we are trying to do is to make knowledge unlatched content available in all traditional channels, but also in the non-traditional ones. So of course you can do with it whatever you want under the Creative Commons licenses, which makes our lives difficult because we can't measure usage if the content is being uh, basically placed in 500 and dif uh, 530 different repositories around the world. But that is how open access is, um, and that is a natural limit to it. On the other hand, we also want to make sure that these books, in the interest of the researchers, are being placed in like discovery systems, for example, in library catalogs, because we feel that that is very important. Not everybody is literate in open access usage on the researcher side, um, and we think that we have to go to these people as well and uh, try to make it as easy discoverable as possible. Um, Usage reports is something which is really important to us, and this is just something which you can't read, it's not that important, but um, what we've been doing is really trying to provide both publishers and libraries as early as possible with as many data points as possible so that they can measure the impact of open access, their open access titles or their acquisition, if they are libraries, um, compared to others. There is a number of limitations to it. Um, one of them is, for example, that if you compare, for example, uh, Springer Nature's um, um, usage data and Knowledge Alleged usage data, which is uh, which is other, um, our usage data are based on a book level. It's a full book that is just one download, while many publishers basically have chapter downloads. That is something which we find difficult to explain. I mean, it's an easy thing, right? But it's difficult to make sure that people just don't compare the, the number, but see what is behind the number. And another issue is um, usage which is not being captured in traditional IP ranges of libraries. Why would you go and register in the IP range of your library um, if you're looking for open access content? Nobody would do that, right? It's the opposite of open access. So, on the other hand, we have been reporting back all the time, and here's an example from the area of Cambridge and Boston. We have been reporting back um, 37 downloads at MIT. This is MIT. 37 downloads uh, in the fourth quarter of 2016, um, and all institutions in Boston, which is Boston University, Harvard University, and MIT, that have been supporting Knowledge Unlatched in that round, of 84 downloads. Now, if you add geolocational data, so basically everybody in the region who is not only logged onto a library system, but just using the content, 
you can see that the numbers are much higher. So we have always been reporting and measuring the impact of open access on between 3.9 to 13.5 percent of the um, actual usage, uh, which is a problem. So now we are already always reporting to libraries not only the IP registered usage, but also the usage beyond that, um, which is two, two lines basically. And then the library has to decide whether the content is something that my mother would read in the evening um, just for leisure or whether it is not something which is really very much close to academic research. And if you see um, the hubs basically where usage takes place on that dashboard there on the right hand side, in the United States, for example, in the Midwest, there is not so much usage. So I think this speaks against the grandma theory uh, that many, or mother theory in my case, that a lot of people are just using this for leisure. You can see that there is a very strong correlation between usage um, in libraries and strong academic research centers and usage around that uh, through geolocational data. Double dipping, a huge issue for us. We know that libraries um, in many cases want to continue to buy print books uh, compared to uh, or together with uh, e-books, but what we mean here is double dipping of the same format, which is the electronic format. And we have a major issue uh, in that respect uh, with our friends uh, on the intermediary side who are not willing to support um, deduplication of open access um, titles. I think um, that has been one of the most frustrating discussions I had in 15 years in publishing, to see that even the large vendors feel that they are technically not able to show a zero price in their systems and just make sure that there is a title available. Uh, what, we are, what we have been doing is an analysis with the big 10 libraries in North America, and they told us that they have a double dipping between what they supported through Knowledge Unlatched and what they would have bought anyways of 50 to 70 percent. That was a sleepless night, and then I realized it, it is a good thing, right? Because it shows that the content that is in Knowledge Unlatched would have been bought anyways by the library. We just need to make sure that they don't buy it twice by accident. Um, so what we want to support is, and that is really the ultimate goal of Knowledge Unlatched, um, is to move as soon as possible budgets from traditional acquisitions into open access acquisitions. And we are trying to build this bridge between the two things. Um, so what we are doing right now is we are trying to support libraries um, by offering um, skeleton mark records at the very beginning of the pledging round so they can put it into their library catalogs to avoid double acquisition. And in the vendor systems for ProQuest and EBSCO, for example, there are also um, lists how you can suppress the acquisition of titles that you are getting through another channel. I'm still hoping that these two vendors will uh, change their course on that, um, but we will see uh, whether that will be the case. Uh, we are teaming up with a few libraries now to increase the push there. Um, to, finishing, to finish off, uh, um, just this little graph to show you what we have been doing over the last um, few years. Knowledge Unlatched really started with the dark green core, which still is um, also from the activity our core still. Um, that is uh, Knowledge Unlatched uh, Select for Books and for Journals. From next year on, we will also do this, I forgot to mention earlier, we will also do this for STM. So there's a very strong interest, interest from publishers already in doing Knowledge Unlatched for STM. And we have held first meetings at the Charleston Conference last week, at the Librarians' Days in different places and so on, that also libraries are really interested in, in that element. Uh, what we have been adding, just as a remark, is KU Partners, as we call them. Uh, you probably know Language Science Press, um, Open Commons and Phenomenology. Uh, we are really happy to welcome Luminos and Open Edition um, as partners. And the idea really is a very easy one. We want to make sure that the outreach team that we have, if you want, the sales team which is out there talking to libraries, and also the technology which is there is being used most efficiently for everybody involved. So all these initiatives can get into that marketplace situation, uh, can team up with us, and uh, we can be more efficient for everybody involved. In my understanding, in open access for books and journals right now, money is not so much the issue. That's at least what we hear every day. But it is really the transparency of the marketplace. Is it clear to everybody what the difference between Luminos and Knowledge Unlatched is? 
And then customers have to make their decision. It's not us, but customers, libraries, research funders have to make the decision what they want to support. Uh, we just want to make sure that it is as easy as possible to compare these different initiatives in one marketplace. Um, that is growing quite substantially right now because um, this marketplace of different open access initiatives is really something that is missing. And again, I think the vendors are not playing a constructive role there in not supporting the move to open access there. KU services is something which we just started a few weeks ago. Some publishers approached us and said, now we have these 15 titles where the funding has been done through Knowledge Unlatched, um, but we have another three titles uh, that are open access and where the funding came through other channels. Can you do us the favor and make sure that the whole outreach, distribution, reporting, all these kinds of things is also being done in the same uh, fashion that the library sees all these titles, for example, in one set of statistics. Uh, we are doing that. We have already eight publishers signed up for that. We expect uh, a few more, and 10 more until the end of the year, um, because what we want to do is to streamline the cooperation between libraries and publishing houses as much as we can. Um, here are some of the partners again, and that was it already. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to, to take any questions. Thank you. We now have time for one or two questions or comments. Jurki. Jurki Lapp from the National Library. In your talk you mentioned the free rider problem. And I wonder what kind of arguments do you use to convince the libraries to participate in the funding for open access books and articles? Because, of course, the problem may be that they will get access anyway, even if it's, if it's paid by somebody else. Yeah, and that's an interesting discussion. You can also see that in um, a lot of workflow issues right now, that the libraries um, have been asking for open access for 15 years and hammered on publishers for 15 years to come up with open access. Now it's all there and nobody wants to pay for it. And I think that is really a challenge in the, in the situation that we are in right now. And I'm not saying that um, because I'm happy that it's on library side no, sites now, uh, on the contrary. What we are telling libraries, and, and that is true, is that a title within Knowledge Unlatch um, only costs them 50% of the cover price of the respective book. Um, so because we share the cost among all of them, um, that is something that uh, limits their cost compared to traditional acquisition already. But ultimately, there is no argument about against free rider if there is something for free in the end. So I think the library community and the research community really has to think hard whether they want to optimize their own budgets or whether there is something that they believe, and I think Knowledge Unlatched is a good example, others as well, Luminos, uh, OLH, and so on, are good examples that it can work on a limited basis but we clearly need the commitment from libraries uh, that they um, don't always look at the last penny and uh, calculate whether this is exactly what uh, is in for them. My feeling is right now that, um, and I understand that, that libraries are much more um, suspicious about um, new initiatives when it comes down to calculations compared to large publishers, uh, um, big deals and so on. Uh, that's probably the only way uh, you can manage the uh, cost increase on those big publishers' deals. Um, but I think it is really something where we often see that people want to politically support it, and um, they free up the money in a lot of cases, also from Finland, by the way. Thank you for the support of the institutions here. Um, but I think it is really important that libraries make this a political statement and then measure the impact, of course. So this is nothing which where we just want uh, a kind of nice guys around to give us money for nothing. Um, it's really important uh, also to then measure the impact. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>